Despite covering more than 70% of the surface of our planet, we know strikingly little about the mysteries of the ocean's depths. In fact, it's often stated that we know more about the surface of the moon than the bottom of the ocean, and in many regards, that's actually entirely true. It's surprisingly difficult to study the murky depths from the lack of sunlight and crushing water pressure and not to mention just how hard it is to send an actual, rather fragile human down there. This means that despite living in an era of unbelievable technological innovation and scientific discovery, the ocean still holds many baffling questions. And in today's video, four that we yet to crack. Everybody is familiar with the novel, the famed unicorn of the sea with its sleek body and signature tusk. It's an elusive whale that lives mostly in the waters around the Arctic, and since we've begun studying it, we've learned a fair bit. For example, we know that its diet consists almost entirely of halibut and cod, and that they're quite picky when it comes to anything else. They can dive as deep as 1,500 meters or almost 5,000 feet, and can hold their breath for nearly 30 minutes. We've even observed narwhals communicating with each other using various clicks and whistles. But for all we know about them, we still can't seem to figure out exactly what that tusk is for. The tusk is actually a canine tooth, and it continues to grow throughout the narwhal's life, reaching a maximum length of three meters, it's about 10 feet. And while every male has a tusk, only about 15% of females have one, and it's significantly smaller. And fun fact here, about one in every 500 males have two tusks. But what's his purpose? Well, for the longest time, it was assumed that they represented a secondary sex characteristic, with a longer tusk indicating a more dominant male in the social hierarchy. Evidence for this included observations that males would often rub their tusks together, an exercise known as tusking, as if they were comparing sizes. Others have suggested that the tusk is used to break surface ice to allow the narwhal to breathe. This would be pretty helpful, considering that a fair number sadly die of suffocation when they get trapped under the thick pad eyes and can't break through. Just before we continue with today's video, a big shout out to our friends at Foreo Sweden for sponsoring this video. Look, you know, finding the perfect gift for someone special can be a bit of a challenge. Me, personally, I've, uh, this is a skincare device, never been a particularly big into skincare person. Uh, my skin was never really that bad, but then I started getting older. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Foreo emailed me and I was like, guys, I'm not running a beauty channel. Are you sure you're there? Were you a good match? Anyway, I said, send me one, I'll use it, and if it all works and everything's legit, I'll, uh, we'll do an ad. And then I did use it, and it's pretty incredible. I use it for two minutes every day, it's a microcurrent device, and it reduced my wrinkles and it made my skin nice. <laughs> So I was like, okay guys, let's work together. But maybe this isn't for you. Maybe it's for that special someone in your life. Whatever, it's packed with amazing technologies that give you a full facial workout in just two minutes. Me in the morning, I shave my head, I brush my teeth, and I use my Foreo Bear. The stimulating microcurrent tones the skin while gentle T-sonic pulsations massage the face and brighten the complexion for a youthful glow. And who doesn't want that? What's even cooler is the Bear's anti-shock system scans and measures your skin resistance to electricity, automatically adjusting the microcurrent intensity for maximum safety and comfort. No shocks, just amazing results. It's also app connected. Once you register your device, it syncs preferences with the Foreo for You app, offering more microcurrent intensities and a guided facial fitness routine. You can follow along with the app or you can use the device independently. So, whether you're looking for a gift for someone special or treating yourself, the Bear by Foreo Sweden is the way to go. And guess what? You can get 21% off the Bear by using the link in the description below. So, go check it out. Your skin deserves some love. And, well, the Bear is here to deliver. And now back to today's video. Following the topic of survival, it's also been suggested that the tusk is used for hunting, which seems logical enough. In fact, drone footage from 2016 showed narwhals smacking fish with their tusks, stunning them long enough to make them easy prey. But every one of these ideas has its issues. It can't be something that is inherently crucial for survival, because females live longer than the males on average, with no tusk being required. And the mating dominance theory lost a lot of favor when it was found that males were actually quite gentle when tusking, quite different from the aggressive, often violent displays of strength seen during mating season in other species around the world. Things got even more confusing when sample analysis showed that the tusks contain as many as 10 million nerve endings, setting it apart from similar features on other animals like a rhino's horn, which is more like a fingernail and has no nerves at all. This means that it likely gathers information about the water and relays it to the brain, 
Thus, it could be used for anything like temperature, salinity, detecting sensitive vibrations, or even sensing nearby prey. And if all of this is true, then it means that when narwhals rub their tusks, they're possibly exchanging information about the environments that they were recently swimming through. It's all very strange, and again, any hypothesis seems weird because if it is indeed so useful, it's quite odd that the females would live longer without having them. Or maybe the males are just so inferior in some way that they need the tusks to level the playing fields, but well, there's not any evidence for that either. So for now, it seems that the exact purpose of the mysterious creature's task will just remain out of reach. Of all the majestic animals that roam the oceans, perhaps none are more awe-inspiring as whales. Sperm whales dive for food at unfathomable depths, plunging up to 2,250 meters or 7,400 feet below the surface. Humpback whales often live purely off fat reserves and can go without food for up to seven months at a time. And of course, the gargantuan blue whale is the largest known animal to have ever existed on Earth. There used to be millions of whales populating the oceans, including hundreds of thousands of blue whales, but exploitation in the 1900s caused the population to plummet, and several species are now threatened with extinction, only having a few thousand left roaming in the wild. What this means is that it's rather hard to study them, and there's quite a bit we just don't know. For starters, breaching. Some whales breach several times per hour, including some of the bigger ones, like humpback and sperm whales. The incredible sight of one of these behemoths launching out of the water and splashing back down as it rolls over is certainly one of the craziest things you can witness from a boat but its purpose is still a bit of an enigma. Now, there are many, many theories and evidence to support several of them. It's possible that breaching is a form of communication to other whales, especially since breaches occur more often in groups. Since whales are known to communicate by slapping their fins or tail on the surface, it would make sense that breaching would be a similar way to communicate when visibility is poor. People have also put forward the idea that the immense smacking of the whale coming back down is perhaps intended to stun prey below the surface. Another theory is that breaching is a quick way to get rid of parasites. Siamids, or whale lice, are nasty little buggers that find their way into the skin folds, nostrils, and eyes of whales, and they're pretty irritating. Since whales don't have hands to wipe them away, blasting them off with a majestic breach and a big smackdown would certainly do the trick. But perhaps the easiest explanation to accept is that, along with some combination of the previous answers, breaching's just a form of play. An easy way for young calves to get out pent-up energy and develop better spatial awareness and control over their body. Another question about whales that has yet to be answered concerns their iconic singing. Their enchanting tunes echoing throughout the depths are so fascinating that a copy of them even made it onto Voyager 1. But why exactly they do it? is still pretty up in the air. Specifically, humpback whales and blue whales in the Indian Ocean produce songs up to 30 minutes long with repeating sounds and ethereal notes. Their songs have been recorded and analyzed time and time again, broken down into phrases, units, and subunits. Over 19 years, similar patterns or notes could be spotted across many songs, but the same song was never sung twice, and there were very few similarities between different songs. Researchers even found that their tone has been getting lower since the 1960s, possibly a way to distinguish their songs from the background noises of ships. So, well, what are they for? They might be for echolocation, or they could be a way to bond with other members of their pod. One of the most interesting theories is that whales create songs simply because they want to, because they find it entertaining. This would certainly be a fascinating answer, but not all that surprising, considering that whales are among the most intelligent creatures on the planet and have shown their level of consciousness on more than one occasion. For example, in 2005, crab fishermen off the coast of San Francisco spotted a humpback whale caught in uh, the many ropes that they'd lowered into the water. With weighted ropes tangled around its face, flippers, and tail so tightly that it was cutting the whale's blubber, the animal was struggling to move, and it was clear that it wasn't going to be able to escape on its own. A daring rescue operation commenced as divers arrived on the scene and descended with the intent of cutting the whale free. At first, the whale panicked as the divers approached, thrashing around and actually posing somewhat of a danger to its saviors. But after a while, it calmed down and watched them intensely. When the final ropes were cut, and the whale was free. Instead of immediately bolting away to safety, he swam in circles around the divers and then approached them all individually, nuzzling them and gently tapping them with its flippers before swimming off, as if spending a little time with them to thank them. It's not exactly testable by science, but if it turns out that whales were more intelligent than we gave them credit for, it could explain much of their strange behavior, like breaching and singing. But for now, we'll just have to keep making guesses as to why these gentle giants do the things they do.
Certainly the most unsettling entry in today's video, the deepest parts of the ocean remain largely unexplored. Only between 10 and 20 percent of the global ocean floor has been mapped in detail, with the crushing pressure being the main factor as to why it's so difficult. But this pressure doesn't stop life from surviving. In fact, in the places most inhospitable to humans, life actually thrives. And it's not just boring microscopic life that hangs out near hydrothermal vents, but entire ecosystems of predators, prey, and scavengers. Some of which are quite frightening. The giant squid, for example, was really only thought to be the stuff of legend for many years, and it wasn't until 2004 that a nearly complete specimen was captured by accident and examined. Surviving at depths of a thousand meters or 3,300 feet, it's understandable why we simply never came across them before. And that begs the question, if the giant squid could go unnoticed for so long, what other monstrosities are hiding where the sunlight can't reach? And we're not talking about the megalodon here, because well, let's be straight, it's extinct and there's no chance of it still being around today. What we are talking about is something called deep sea gigantism or abyssal gigantism, the tendency for deep sea invertebrates to be much larger than their shallow water relatives. The giant squid is a perfect example of this, as is the Japanese spider crab, species of giant clam and more. It's well within the realm of possibility that in the deep in the middle of the Pacific Ocean there could be colossal octopi, jellyfish bigger than anything we've ever seen, massive lobsters, and much more. The imagination is the limit, simply because the majority of this dark realm is completely unexplored. This might be one mystery that gets at least somewhat resolved in the near future, though, as there is currently a massive undertaking by the UN to provide a complete map of the ocean floor by 2030. Project Seabed 2030 has already contributed a substantial amount of data about the bottom of the oceans, but whether or not they're on track to hit that 2030 deadline is anybody's guess. But remember, this is just the bottom of the oceans. There's still thousands of meters of unexplored water above that remaining in the shadows, with a seemingly unlimited potential for scientific wonders to be unveiled. So we'll end today with a mystery that was partially solved in the last couple of years, and it's all about eels. Put simply, eels are weird, especially European eels. They're catadromous, meaning they spawn in the ocean but live most of their life in fresh water. They begin their life as tiny, largely transparent larvae that drift around in ocean currents for months before floating to coastal or freshwater habitats. Once they've reached freshwater, they begin a remarkable metamorphosis, transforming into glass eels that are still transparent, but they begin to resemble what we think of as an eel. Eels will then spend years or even decades living in this freshwater environment before reaching sexual maturity, at which point they start to change in shape and color. When they're ready to reproduce, they leave their freshwater home and venture back into the sea, heading to where their own life began to spawn younglings before dying. For the longest time, researchers just took wild stabs at figuring out this mysterious life cycle. No one had observed European eels laying eggs, giving birth, or mating. To make matters even weirder, eels don't have genitalia, and the only way to differentiate between males and females is to wait until they reach sexual maturity, then dissect them and carefully analyze their gonads. But of course, this wasn't known until modern times, leaving Aristotle back in the day so baffled by their mere existence that he concluded they must spontaneously spring up from mud. In the 18th century, an Italian scientist finally found an eel's ovaries, but a male had yet to be identified, leaving everyone scratching their heads looking for their elusive testicles. Even Sigmund Freud got sucked into the quest because of course he did, and in a few weeks during his time in university, he dissected hundreds of eels which he claimed had all been of the female variety since he failed to find any eel family jewels. He finally found the treasure he had been looking for in eel number 400. What Freud didn't know is that eels don't necessarily have a determined sex at birth like humans do. When eels hatch, they're sexless, and they develop their sexual characteristics later in life, meaning Freud probably chopped up more than a few would-be males before they had a chance to show it. But this was still only a single piece of the mystery. More information was uncovered when researchers began breeding eels in captivity, which is when they found out that they had to use hormones to speed up sexual maturity as it normally takes up to 20 years. Turns out that females release millions of eggs into the water, which are then fertilized by the males. Still though, this has yet to be observed in the wild. It was long believed that the location of this massive birth cycle was in the Sargasso Sea, a region in the Atlantic Ocean, but researchers always lost the eels' tracks before actually finding anything. It wasn't until 2022 that the Sargasso Sea was confirmed as the breeding ground when satellite tags tracked the eels through the entire return journey. This was a big step in confirming an important part of their life cycle, but much of the process has still yet to be observed in the wild, unexpectedly leaving the humble eel as one of the most mysterious creatures that the ocean has revealed to us thus far. <laughs>